Hi, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. Good seat taken. Hey, Kiernan. Hi, Ryan. How are you? I'm great. How are you? You know, uh, just before we started recording, you told me I'm a little off, so I can't say that I'm great. <laughs> Where was that coming from, that I'm a little off? I think I'm really on. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think that we should let our listeners decide how off or on you are, you know? Where, I, where, where are you uh, seeing offness? I, well, I do believe that you uh, fumbled the tagline a minute ago, uh, and, you know, the quest for the tagline has been a, a pretty, pretty dominant part of the first... 42 episodes of Out of Office. So <laughs> listen, just because just because I was trying to uh, bring back pack your, <laughs> pack your bags Buster Brown. That's the 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 tagline that could have been people are still clamoring for it, but we settled yeah. on this seat taken. This yeah. I, I, and I and I'm happy to remind you whenever you forget that it is this seat taken. This seat taken. Now Ryan, um we have good uh, listener question today. Pretty straightforward. Uh so uh, a listener Brenda wrote in. Hey Brenda. Brenda asks uh, Kiernan, you often brag about how you're an Uber planner when you travel. That's Ooh. certainly true. The yeah. major theme of the show yeah. uh, that I encourage planning as the best way to, to enjoy yourself. Uh, Brenda continues, have you ever gone on a trip, found a place where you've been so taken by the possibilities that you threw out your plans and just enjoyed yourself? <laughs> have you ever really just enjoyed yourself? Um, so uh, that's the uh, thank you, Brenda, for the question. Uh, the answer is no. I cannot think of a trip that I took where I thought uh, that uh, pre-planning or, or those uh, those uh, attractions that I had decided I wanted to see in advance uh, uh, went by the wayside so that I could enjoy things, uh, just kind of go with the flow. Now, that's not to say I am open to, you know, speaking to people on the ground once I'm there. I like to create some free space in my schedule so that I can uh, take in attractions that maybe I'm not aware of or that aren't broadly known, written up in guidebooks. Past guest Anissa Halu uh, said that she was very skeptical of guidebooks because she feels like they miss some of that on the ground magic. And Ryan, I know uh, you're you're someone who believes you know go to a place and and uh, be open to discovery. Yeah, I definitely leave. I definitely leave time for discovery to meet people to 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 see things that maybe I don't know about. I mean, especially if I'm going to a city that that is not as well documented, right? Like if you're going to a city like like Bucharest, you know, um, you know, there are things that you that you can figure out from the internet and from guidebooks, but there are there are like restaurants and bars and things like that, that, that are just sort of hard to find and that you actually need to go there and kind of talk to people and figure out what to do. Yeah. That reminds me of when I went to Lviv in Ukraine, that was, uh, you know, not a, not a very popular, uh, tourist destination. I remember when we got on the overnight train, uh, the sort of very, uh, brusque looking border guard, uh, looked at my passport and said, American. Uh, with with just this judgment that suggested we don't get a lot of you here. Yeah, he didn't like the quotes on the passport. No, guess not. Good reference back to the <laughs> the last episode. Um, and uh, yeah, so sometimes you do have to be ready to go with the flow uh, when you can't do as much advanced planning as I like. But you know, Brenda is uh, here uh, reminding us that you can't plan every second of a trip. That is something that I need to hold myself back from, and I am trying to get better of uh, leaving open afternoons, maybe even full open days, uh, where I can insert uh, attractions that come out on the ground. But I've never fully thrown out the, the guides that I create before I, before I head out. Have you ever uh, made, a, made a plan and uh, you couldn't do it because like the museum was, was like closed of for course, construction of that week? Yeah, okay. yeah so, that so you have been like, and you're not totally befuddled. You figure out something to do. You don't yes. just stand there <laughs> and, and stare at the museum for three hours like, I should be inside, you know? A reoccurring theme is that my wife, Catherine, has a phrase that she comes back to time and again, which is, that's a reason to come back. Reason to come back. Exactly. And she always deploys that chestnut when we reach a place and we're not able to do what I want. I mean, you know, there are going to be times where the attraction you want to see is under construction or the hours have changed from what was reported online or they're sold out for the day. I try to do everything I can to figure it out. You know, so I'll, I'll go to attractions, Facebook pages, Twitters and their website to try to see, are they reporting closures? Cause I want to see these things and I have to be better at, uh, embracing that you can't always do everything you want. 
And, and, and I, I do really struggle with that. I'm sure others do as well. But I think a healthy attitude would be exactly what Brenda's getting at, which is, okay, maybe I can't do this amazing thing, but maybe I can find something even better. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so much that you can figure explore in a city once you get there. So I, I, I'm with Brenda. I, I like to leave that time. Even, I don't even need there to be a museum uh, uh, closure for me to like have some free time to kind of explore and be serendipitous and fun. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can also be, um, you got to be flexible to a certain degree. So a good example of that, Catherine and I were traveling in Poland and, uh, in the area outside of Krakow, there is a salt mine that you can uh, go in and visit. It's super fascinating tour. And when we showed up, uh, there were no, uh, English language tours for like three or four hours to after we showed up. And uh, we we went up to the desk and we said, you know, do you have any tours? And they said, well, sure, we're, we're running a Polish tour right now, but you, you can't join that. <laughs> we said, why not? And they said, well, you won't understand anything. We don't allow people who don't speak Polish uh, on these tours. And How do they so, know you didn't speak Polish? Well, that's what we said. Well, okay, uh, your lucky day, our lucky day, because we are uh, fluent, fluent Polish speakers, you know, and so to, to make that more believable, I made sure to, uh, to take the, my, my crucifix out, you know, and make them feel like, you know, a Catholic brother here and, uh, turned to Catherine and said, isn't that right, Magdalena, you know, a good Polish girl, I, you know, that Catherine, good Polish girl or Magdalena. Sorry, Magdalena. Yes. Magdalena. Well, uh, well, I think that we've answered Brenda's question and, uh, you know, Thank you for writing in. More questions, always welcome, outofofficepod at gmail.com. And uh, with that, I think it's time to take off. Let's get to your interview. Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff, please. All right, we are here with a uh, filmmaker and uh, occasionally good friend of mine, uh, Chase Whiteside. Thanks for joining us, Chase. Yeah, and current roommate. Um, I think we used to be friends, and now we're just roommates. That's actually. true, that's true. So this is actually the first ever out of office in person conversation. So it's actually weird. I usually see Kieran as like a postage stamp in the in the bottom, you know, of my of my the corner of my laptop. Uh, but you're here in, in in the flesh in 3D. It's a first for me as well. You know, normally I only hear your end of the podcast. I, I can't hear <laughs> what Kiernan says. So the better half of the podcast, I assume, goes unheard by me. Yeah, the the Kiernan half is uh, <laughs> it really helps it all make sense. Uh, but where 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 is Kiernan? Kiernan is uh, doing a tour of Pacific Northwest National Parks, oh, right. and we're going to talk about that on the podcast pretty soon. But I he's look been to that episode. He's been gone for two weeks. He's just been out there in the wilderness, you know. Um, so that's you know, Kiernan's a lot like Teddy Roosevelt. He just likes just you know go off and and spend just weeks sort of walking the earth. I bet. Well, before we get started here, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to you and to Kiernan for having me on the show. Um, and uh, I wanted to say hello to your respective families. I think this is a great way for you guys to to stay in touch with them. Um, and it's it's really it's really great to include me. I feel like I've been invited to a wedding. Yeah. Well, we're hoping that we'll get uh, your family also to to turn, tune in huh. uh, to the pod. So, Chase, we are here to discuss your uh, your journeys with a documentary film that you made called America. Yeah. Um, and in full disclosure, I was a extremely assistant assistant producer on America. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have gotten to go on some of these journeys with you, but you know, not not to the most interesting places. Sorry, uh, Copenhagen. Um, but can you give us some background on the film? Sure. So America is a film that was made in Colima, Mexico. It's about three brothers who have to come together and take care of their 94-year-old grandmother under somewhat unusual circumstances. So it's a verite documentary, which means that there's not, it's not, you know, there aren't interviews, there are no graphics or something like that. It just, it uh, follows them through this journey that they take together as caretakers. And this is a film that has no superheroes in it or um, any kind of space aliens or you anything? Know, I'd like to think of caretakers as superheroes, Whoa. but space aliens, <laughs> space aliens, no. Um, uh, and you said this was filmed in Colima, Mexico? Yeah, that's right. Uh, over the course of uh, how much time? Oh, God. You know, it took... In total, it took about four years to make. Um, and so, and we started about five years ago. It's been it's been traveling around for the past year. And sort of the origins of the film, um, prior to sort of discovering uh, America, were travel related. Isn't that right? It, it's true. We were actually working on a podcast about how horrible American tourists are elsewhere. I'm sorry, not a podcast, but <laughs> <laughs> that's what you're working on. No, um, 
Uh, we were working on a documentary about how horrible American tourists are in Mexico, essentially. I mean, that's I'm, I'm being glib. It was it was basically uh, a look at the economy uh, of Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And we met uh, who ended up being the person we'd follow for several years, Diego, a very talented circus artist when he was working in hotels there. And and that's what kind of set us off on a, on a totally different project. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it, it would be I, I hope we hear an over tourism episode from from the out of office team soon. Oh, yeah. Uh, pretty much every episode we, we may contribute to over tourism. So we're going to make one to cover that. <laughs> exactly. Cover that soon. So. Um, when you're filming this this uh, uh, documentary over over the course of these years, um, you must really get to know the cities that you're working in. Yeah, in this case, we were mostly in Puerto Vallarta, Colima, and Querétaro, and so those are three different cities in Mexico, um, in between the states of Jalisco, Colima, and Querétaro. Uh, and yeah, we got to know those places very well. It's worth noting, though, that the experience of uh, living and staying in those places uh, for work or for pro a project. It's different than being a tourist, and that we're not we're not on vacation. There's not uh, we're not staying at hotels or, or or things like that. So it's. But in the course of of the time you spent there, did you get to sort of do some of the touristy things that you would do if you were there on on vacation? Because I'm sure you're not filming 24 hours a day. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, uh, my co filmmaker, which is that we, we did film 24 <laughs> hours a day. Uh, yeah, there are some plenty of midnight scenes that happen in the film. That's so. true. Um, yeah, I, I mean, a bit. I guess it, it really depends. And in, in Vallarta, it's a super tourist area, and we were in part filming the tourist industry. So certainly we we were a part of all of that. And I know that city like the back of my hand at this point, and it's very easy to make recommendations to people who are traveling there. Uh, but Colima is not really a place where a lot of tourists visit. And so it doesn't have much of a tourist infrastructure. There aren't There aren't usual things that tourists do, for instance. But it's also a pretty small place. So if there was something to do... I, I probably did it. Yeah. Was was there something that kind of stood out that you saw that was especially beautiful or interesting in, in Kalima? Yeah, actually, I think it would be a great place to visit. So it's this colonial town that is, uh, mo it's close to a place called Manzanillo, which is the most known uh, city within the state of Kalima, which is basically a port city where a huge amount of the Chinese goods which come into Mexico go first. Um, but Kalima is this colonial town that's further inland in the state. It's not on the beach. Uh, and it's really charming and lovely. It's got like three or four beautiful uh, gardens in Centro in the middle of town. Um, it's got, you know, wonderful old churches, 200, 300 year old churches. So it was one of the very first uh, uh, capitals of New Spain. And, and, and a lot of that colonial architecture is, is, is still very much intact. And you do get to see some of that uh, in, in the film uh, where, where, you know, the, the, the folks are kind of traveling around to various parks and, and uh, restaurants. I don't think you see a lot of restaurants. Yeah, I don't think you see a lot of restaurants. No, the, the, either. Yeah, the, the Puerto Vallarta <laughs> section has has some restaurants. <laughs> um, it's yeah, you do. You, you see, see government see, office mostly, buildings. Mostly, what you get in terms of getting a sense of Kalima in the film, mostly what you get are like skyline shots. So, yeah, I remembering one scene that takes place on top of a roof. Yeah, uh, that actually, and that's a, a, a it's the highest point in Kalima is a parking garage. Um, <laughs> and to give you a sense, uh, but uh, it, it in the main. Uh, town center there's a parking garage you can go up to the top and you can see the whole town and it's like i said it's a really 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 lovely town it's very it seems like a great place to go and just spend time reading or or, or doing some deep work yeah uh, it doesn't seem like a place <laughs> you'd want to go to you know have a have some kind of adventure vacation or something i think in 37 episodes this is the first parking garage that's gotten a shout out so uh there parking you go. garage Colima, mexico great <laughs> uh great vista so uh you finish up the film yeah. And uh, basically what happens next is it gets submitted to uh, a ton of film festivals. Can you, can yeah. you talk about that process a little bit? Sure. Uh, I mean, you know, there's really a lot to say. This is for a very different podcast. But in, to, to sum it all up, um, you, you send the film out or it's invited by a handful of festivals. The festival circuit, there are a lot of film festivals internationally. Uh, this is a documentary, so it's kind of a subset of those festivals. It both goes to general film festivals as well as documentary-only film festivals. and uh, yeah, you submit to many of them. Our film did the film did very well, um, and so it play, it's played now uh, something around. It's more than sixty festivals. I'm not exactly sure what the number is, uh, and you know many of those you're invited to attend, and the the festival will will sponsor your travel and and your uh, lodging to to be part of the festival. And uh, you had a a, a co director, co filmmaker. Yeah, Eric Stoll. Right, so Eric and you would would uh, sort of divide some of this travel time. 
Well, yeah, I mean, it was actually, if you have a co, it's, I don't suggest co-directing a documentary film with anyone because the, one of the benefits of doing this is the travel is the idea that afterward you get to travel around with your film. You get to screen it with many different international audiences. You get to talk about the content of your film with people who see things very differently. Obviously the film is very differently received in Mexico than it was in China, let's say. Um, but we had to divvy it up. So there were a lot of times where it was like there was a very, very cool, exciting place to go. And we had to kind of like, you know, flip a coin and decide, OK, they only have money to take one of us. Who's it going to be? So, um, so, so you mentioned uh, China. Can you give uh, an overview of sort of what your travel has been like over the over the last year with with the film? Yeah, it's been crazy. So um, it, I, I'm, I'm probably not going to remember everywhere that I went or that Eric went, um, but you, you went, so you went with us on our first international, Copenhagen, and I'll skip yeah. the domestic cities. You guys don't, sure. we don't need to talk about Columbia, Missouri. and <laughs> Great city, Columbia, Missouri. Though. Eh. But, <laughs> um, so let, let me think here. So the first, our international was, uh, our international premiere was in Copenhagen, which I went to with you. Um, we were in the UK a handful of times, uh, not my favorite place to travel. Uh, we went to Italy, um, Spain, Germany, uh, Macedonia, Kosovo, Iraq, China, uh, Eric went to Australia. I'm sure I'm leaving important places out. So uh, the, the uh, Iraq sort of sticks out as, as uh, right. not a city that you think of having like a rich, you know, a film festival culture. Yeah. Uh, they what, don't. Yeah. So where did you, where, where did you go in Iraq? Cause Iraq is a, a big, Big country with a lot of diversity in cities. Yeah, so I was in Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, there was the in a city called Duak, and there's a film festival there called the Duak International Film Festival. But it's actually just like uh, a, it's actually just a PR stunt. So there's this big, complicated debate happening within Iraq right now between Iraqi Kurdistan and Central Arab Iraq, its central government, over the visa requirements for visitors. And Kurdistan basically says, if you're from the United States, you're from these places, you don't need to go through any process. You can literally, you can just go. So if you wanted to visit right now, if you wanted to visit Iraqi Kurdistan, you can just go. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know why you would, but you could do it if you wanted to. You can't go to Baghdad. So uh, what city did you fly into in, in Iraq? Yeah, so there's, there's only one international airport in Iraqi Kurdistan, which is in Erbil. And so we flew into Erbil, or I, I actually, it was just me. I flew in alone to Erbil. And... I, you know, I think my trip, I ended up flying Turkish air to Istanbul and then uh, from there to Erbil on a very, you know, a very small, small plane. So I get there. I, I'm, I'm not nervous to arrive or anything necessarily, but I'm like, I, I think that, you know, the process of going through visa, uh, the immigration check is going to be somewhat complicated. It, it wasn't at all. I mean, it took two seconds. It was like the fastest immigration experience I've ever had. So if you just want to fly to uh, herbal. There's like no questions asked. It's like, hey, what's <laughs> up? You know, come in. So I get there, and then you know, I've got like a, I've got like a, a guy who works as a volunteer for the festival. He's going to drive me to Duak, which is about two and a half hours away by car. Um, and it was a really intense experience. I mean, it's unlike anywhere else I've ever traveled because you arrive, and then I'm traveling through Iraqi Kurdistan, which is mostly just desert. Um, there's significant numbers of security checks and the security checks can be rather intense, including, you know, mirrors under the cars, things like this. Um, the driver didn't speak any English. Uh, he also rather notably had a long argument with someone on the phone. So while I'm in the back of this car <laughs> arriving for the first time in Iraq, he is, you know, screaming with great emotion right. at someone in a language I can't understand. So, um, <laughs> comforting. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was, it was really quite a welcome. Um, and then you know, the city of Duak is, is, is not a pleasurable city. It's not a, there's no beauty. There's nothing beautiful about it. Um, and it, the festival itself, like I said, was kind of a PR stunt to push their narrative of the internationalism and openness of Kurdistan versus Arab Iraq. Uh, and so the film festival itself was pretty underattended. Uh, it was took place in this mall, this horrible mall. Um, like one of those, one of those big tacky, like luxury malls. It, well, luxury would really be too strong of a word for it. It was a just a big, plain kind of crappy mall right. with a so, lot of security. So it wasn't like a new, a brand new mall they were trying no. to show. No, I mean it might even if it was, it might be newish. Like, but it was not. There was nothing luxury about it. It was just a mall. But it was a place where um, 
I guess people could come and socialize in a certain kind of modern context. But the most exciting thing I did was go to the markets out in town, right. which were which were large and active. But one of the experience of being there that's notable, especially, you know, living and traveling from New York, there are no women in public life. So when you're at the mall, when you're at these markets, there are just no women. So it, it's sort of like, you know, being in Hell's Kitchen. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, it's also definitely not like being in Hell's Kitchen. Um, there are also no visible gay men. Uh, right. You may be disappointed to find out. Um, so uh, when you're at this festival, do the organizers try to, to show you things in the, in the city that would be memorable or that, that you would in, yeah. enjoy? So you could come back and say nice things about it when you're on a podcast. Yeah, God, you'd think so. But so I had, so I had this handler who was supposed to be with me at all times. He was kind of like my shadow. And part of this was a security thing. They're, 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 you know, this is um, extremely close to what would have been ISIS territory not that long ago when I was there. Um, and in fact, you even, you even you passed through uh, on the way in different uh, Syrian refugee camps. It was a really wild thing to see. You know, arriving somewhere as a visitor, um, but so I had this handler. He was maybe eighteen or nineteen years old. He was a kid, um, and he drove you know this this pretty serious sport utility vehicle. And so I had basically they'd kind of contained us within the hotel and this mall. Right. Like they weren't really letting us go a bunch of places. But I was pretty determined to to get away. Um, so I, I I met up with another guy, uh, Malas, a wonderful Iranian cinematographer who was there, and we had kind of endeavored to convince our respective handlers to like take us out into the town because we were like you know getting pretty bored in the hotel in the mall here, and so we go, we sell him like, well, what's your very favorite place to eat? And he took us to what I think is probably the worst pizza I've ever had. <laughs> it was just like it was like the saddest pizza. Yeah. And the food at the festival wasn't so, you know, it was like hummus. And Did you and, eat at the market? Uh, no. And the, the market wasn't mostly prepared food. It was mostly Oh, so it's not, like, it's not like when I think of like a Mexico City market where... No. Yeah. No, or even, a, or even a Turkish market. No, it yeah. wasn't this. I mean, look, there are probably other markets we didn't go to that did have those kind of prepared foods. But the one we went to was mostly produce, you know. And so, no, we didn't, we didn't eat in the market. I mean, there was a lot of opportunities to, to drink coffee or, um, you know, smoke hookah or things like that. Uh, or tea. Um, but so, no. So another place that you mentioned that was sort of uh, unique was Kosovo. Um, what, was the, uh, what was the Kosovo festival like? Well, Kosovo, okay, so it's interesting to, to think that I went to uh, Iraqi Kurdistan and Kosovo, which are like the only two Muslim-majority populations that love Americans. But this was much more evident in Kosovo. So the whole time I was in Kosovo, people were just uh, excited that, I mean, people would say, like, where are you from? And you'd say, you'd say, I'm from the United States. And they'd be like, all right. And they'd want to buy you a drink. I mean, I've never been that celebrated to be an American, literally anywhere. I can't, I mean, <laughs> can you think of a place where people are that happy to see Americans? Not, Not these and, days. <laughs> and, and, and let me just tell you how happy they are to see Americans. In um, Pristina, the capital of Kosovo, there is a large statue of Bill Clinton. Really? A yeah. statue of Bill Clinton? It is a large it is a larger than life size statue of Bill Clinton, of President Bill Clinton. Yeah. Um, you know, because he's so celebrated there for what he did. Uh, sure, sure, with General Wesley Clark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> um it, you know the the politics of all of that are even complicated, but <laughs> not to unpack here on the on the travel. So I was it was a trip. It was actually a two part trip. So I first went in the Kosovo, and then I went to Macedonia. And so to go to these former Yugoslavian states was an opportunity also to read about the breakup of Yugoslavia, which is extremely complicated. We we won't unpack here. But in Kosovo, we first went to this extraordinary town called Prizren, and Prizren used to be a town that people traveled to to vacation, even within former Yugoslavia. So it is. It's just lovely. It's just this lovely town with a lovely river running through it. And I think it would be a great place for anyone to take a trip. And um, we we left from there to other towns uh, just as tourists within Kosovo. And there's not a lot to see. I mean, it's not, it's mostly desert. It's not like an extraordinary place to spend time. I will say this, both Macedonia and Kosovo have like plentiful, extremely cheap, and really quite good white wine. It's like everywhere you go for like two bucks, you can get uh, just uh, an excellent cold glass of white wine at any time of the day, and it's completely normal. Nobody frowns upon ordering 11 a.m. a glass of white wine in either of these contexts, which is, yeah. that's, that's a good, that's a society I can get into. Yeah, you'd pay a little more for that at, at uh, you know, 
at Henry's if you're getting some some Kosovo wine. Yeah, at Henry's. Yeah, Henry's, of course, you know, known to the full audience of this podcast. Uh, Henry's been a guest on this podcast. Is that true? <laughs> yes, oh, we did well. a whole episode on natural wine. Should... I hope it was more organized than this. <laughs> um, so, um, but oh, let me just get, uh, touch a, a bit more on Kosovo sure, here because sure. it's interesting. So we then cross from Kosovo to Macedonia. I won't go through that driver's story, which was like a 90 mile an hour BMW <laughs> driven by someone who I think was still very much for, uh, you know, a united Yugoslavia. Um, <laughs> but Macedonia, the capital of Macedonia, is in the middle of basically a massive massive reconstruction of the city of Skopje to with all of this neo like classical architecture to basically make it look like an ancient Greece and and so while, this is all being re, this is all being redone like when you walk in in downtown Prague where it, everything it'd be is like arriving fake. to Washington DC just as they were building the mall and right. just as they were building <laughs> the capital um it, so when, when I was there they were in the really last bit of this debate with Greece. So there's been this long debate with Greece between Macedonia and Greece over the name Macedonia. Because Macedonia, of course, the ancient kingdom of Macedon, where Alexander the Great is from, is actually not where modern day Macedonia is. No, it's not. No, it's not. And so they have kind of tethered themselves to a, you know, cultural foundation that has no real, you know, basis on the geography where the country is located. It's like sort of like an Epcot, like a yeah, I mean, you know, they say, okay, but the people who spoke the Macedonian language, that where right. it ended up surviving was in this area, whatever. But so they were in the thick of this debate. But so there's this big effort to build this kind of like history, including big, uh, you know, beautiful uh, outdoor sculptures and displays honoring Alexander the Great again, which never lived in the <laughs> modern country of Macedonia. Um, yeah, and so it's, 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 it's a wild place to go for that reason. It's not even beautiful. It's just weird. It feels like going to Las Vegas or something and having like a, a, an ancient Greece. Uh, is, there, is there an ancient Greece uh, style hotel? And, and there should be. I, well, it's Caesar's Palace. Caesar's Palace, of course. Yeah. yeah. So it's sort of like Caesar's Palace. It's like Caesar's Palace, the country. Um, but the, the best part about it was there was it, within Skopje, there's this beautiful uh, Muslim bazaar. Um, this was much better than what we had seen in Duak, for whatever that's worth. I mean, it, not that they would be related for any other reason than their sure. markets on my film tour. But uh, really, and this is where the festival was held in this 400-year-old, uh, you know, uh, Turkish-built monastery, just beautiful building. And so this was the loveliest part of the city. So if you ever have any reason to go to Skopje, spend time in the Muslim area, which I actually believe is the is like the principal tourist zone, despite the best efforts of these, uh, these city planners. Uh, wait, so when you were in, in, in both of these countries, did you see a lot of uh, American tourists, or were there a lot, a lot of other filmmakers from the States visiting? No. So, and actually, in all, in all of these festivals we've spoken about, there's not a significant number of American filmmakers. Most of these, most of these festivals have principally European filmmakers who are visiting. Gotcha. Um, there were some. I mean, there's a, there are some exceptions, but no. I, I want to say that at in Macedonia, we were the only ones. It's a festival called Makadox, which is it's a really lovely, wonderful, very small festival with a great program. But I think, yeah, I think we were the only Americans there. And, you know, Prizren Kosovo is a tourist destination, but it's mostly from the Albanian diaspora. So people from, you know, the Albanian diaspora, I mean, it's, you, you got it here in Queens, it's in uh, Germany in great numbers. And so people go back to Prizren to visit uh, at Kosovo. And in fact, the economy of Kosovo is still principally uh, incoming money from the Albanian diaspora. It's not natively produced. Let's move to a, another continent Please. Um, for a second. So, uh, Out of the, the Balkans so soon. <laughs> so the, the film was shot in, in Kalima, as, we, as we've talked about. Um, how has it been received in, in Mexico and, and uh, what, is, what has its life been like there? It's been received really well, which, you know, we're Eric and I are two white American filmmakers making a film in Mexico and the history of white filmmakers making films other places is not great um, to say the least. Uh, and so it was a great responsibility to us to do uh, to make an honest film. And, you know, there's no zoom ins of tortilla stands or there's no uh, ranchera mu ranchera music placed arbitrarily in the soundtrack or anything like that. Um, so it's, its life in Mexico has been very important to us. It's been received extraordinarily. So the film was part of this traveling festival called Ambulante, which is, it was started by the actors Diego Luna and um, 
Gail Garcia Bernal. Oh, the 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 guys from um, the friends in Eat the Mama Tambien. See, si, right? si, yeah, yeah. So uh, they started this documentary festival. I want to say about a decade ago or something, and it's uh, it's extraordinary. And it travels around to all these different places in Mexico. It goes to Oaxaca. It goes to Veracruz. It goes uh, to different states in the north to um, Querétaro to Guadalajara, and so. Uh, our film traveled around with that, and we got the opportunity also to travel around with the festival, with the film, and screening in all of these open plazas and with different audiences around the country. And so it was extremely rewarding to us how well the film was received, um, and it's still traveling. It's going to be in it's going to be in a handful of other cities uh, still later this year. So it's still kind of working its way through through the country. And what was that like to do uh, Q and A's uh, in in Mexico? Um, I, I imagine that the only places that you used your Spanish to do Q and A's would have right. been in Spain and 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 uh, in Mexico. Yeah, that's true. Um, so it was, you know, I, I speak Spanish and I, I I speak fairly well, but there's something still really difficult about having someone's kind of long winded question asked at you and then responding and making sure everything is kind of cogent and sounds good. So. It was it was a challenge for that reason, but it was it was fine. I mean, look, the the film is can it can be tough. It's a it's a film about caretaking, and it's kind of an unforgiving look at what that reality looks like. And so we got a lot of emotional questions. I mean, a lot of times in Mexico, it wasn't so much questions about the filmmaking or the process so much as it was people wanting to share their own stories of caretaking, how what they were seeing on the screen was relevant to them in their own lives. And so there were a lot of tears. And, you know, normally if someone comes at me crying, uh, I think it's, ooh, it's time to break up. So um, <laughs> so this was very different to try and, and, and learn to be uh, patient and, uh, and, and receive these stories and realize that it, as a filmmaker, it's a blessing to get them really. It's, a, it's something I think very special, but uh, it's not socially. It doesn't come easy to me to, to, you know, to just respond to people who are crying. It's also the case that part of the content of the film is critical of the Mexican government and its right. services that are offered. And of course, you, you, everyone can relate to, to sure. that. Yeah, no, I don't think anyone's happy and entirely with the, the domestic services that they're being offered. No, it's, I mean, it's actually, a, yeah. So the if you're going nice to hate on a country's government at all, um, it'll be better received in that country than other places. No one's really outraged by like the, the healthcare system in some other country, you know. <laughs> oh, the Republicans seem pretty outraged about the NHS on occasion. Um, well, look, if, if uh, listeners want to see the film, what, what are some of the opportunities for them to, to do that? Um, well, if you're in the United States on October 7th, it'll, it'll air on PBS on their POV program. Um, if you're in New York City, it'll have a week at MOMI in September. That's MOMI with an I, Museum of the Moving Image in Astoria. Um, Otherwise, it's uh, best to just look at the website, americadocumentary.com, where we have its upcoming festival dates uh, posted. And so that, that way, all of your family and all of Kiernan's family will have the opportunity uh, to see the film. Uh, and, and to close us out, um, uh, you and I had the opportunity to go to MoMA recently yeah. uh, for uh, Julia Reichard's uh, 50 years in film celebration. Yeah. Can you, uh, we've talked about MoMA a lot on the, the show. Can you just give us a little bit of background of, of Julia's career? Yeah, gosh, where to start with Julia? So Julia Riker is this, uh, she's sometimes called the grandmother of documentary film. So Julia Riker has been making films, as uh, her retrospective uh, title suggests, for uh, 50 years. So she started out making films uh, that were about what it meant to grow up female. Her first film, Growing Up Female, was about uh, life as a young woman in a, play, in, a, in a culture which didn't really recognize or talk about young women's needs whether they be about their body or about satisfaction or career, so much. Uh, that film was part of the National uh, Film Registry, admitted in the same year, I think, as The Silence of the Lambs and Forrest Gump, interestingly enough. Um, and she went on to make several films largely uh, covering uh, minority political and labor movements in the country uh, and was nominated. she's been nominated three times for an Oscar. Uh, just this year, uh, she won Best Director uh, for Documentary at Sundance with her partner, Stephen Bognar, uh, for their new film, American Factory. Uh, and that was purchased by Netflix, will be coming out on Netflix. And so she's just this extraordinary filmmaker who's made uh, you know, activist and political-based documentary work for a long, long time that I had the great benefit of studying under. And so it's, uh, it's overdue. I mean, the idea of like Julia's big uh, recognition coming after she'd been doing it for 50 years and being nominated and uh, all the while. 
but uh, it, it's very much deserved. And so it was, it was, it was great to see her honored in that way. And I'm going to uh, forever have the memory of us trying to get her to MoMA on time for yeah. her uh, Q and a um, having to cross, I believe three parades. Yeah. Well, you really, yeah, well, right. So it's, it's <laughs> summer. So New York city is basically yeah. destroyed by parades all the time. It's not, and it's, and this is not just as gay folk. Okay. These are yeah. there's parades for everybody. Yeah. And so it was actually, Ryan, it was to your credit that Julie even made it to her MoMA reception because um, uh, getting across town and navigating that was, was a real nightmare. It was, it, it was, it was, it was fun though. I mean, we, we all had to uh, do a lot in negotiating with police, which is. Yeah. I, I think you just <laughs> lied to the police. <laughs> we will link in the show notes to uh, some of those places where folks can, uh, can turn out to see these movies because, um, you know, I, I got to go, uh, with you to see uh, a line in the house, mm -hmm. which was, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, a tough film, a very, a, an, an incredibly tough film. Uh, it was, uh, you know, a lot to do on a Sunday afternoon, mm -hmm. um, cause it deals with childhood cancer and, and, yeah. and, and families that are battling, uh, that illness. And, uh, I, I believe it hasn't been screened in theaters for a while cause it originally was filmed, uh, was for PBS, correct? Yeah. So it, it did have, you know, it would have had a theatrical back when it was released more than right. a decade ago, but it was, it was principally made for PBS. It went on to win the Emmy for best documentary that year. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it, it's, it's really, a, I think special that there is an opportunity to see it in theaters and it's, it's like, you know, we're, we're not kidding when we say it's a tough film. It's a film about children with cancer. So it's not an easy, it's not an easy thing to convince people to go see, but it's truly inspiring. It's really, a, a, I think, a, a, a worthwhile film to see. And she has some more upbeat films if, if yeah. folks want to check. Even American out. Factory, her new one, yeah. is much more fun. Okay, well, we'll link, to, uh, we'll link in the show notes to where people can check out the, uh, that exhibition. And uh, Chase Whiteside, thank you so much for uh, walking from your office to the kitchen table and joining us here at Isle of Office. Well, we will have you back to, to, to and you and I can uh, maybe talk about some of our adventures, which will be uh, a totally different kind of podcast. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. And uh, now it's time for the last stop. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last stop on this train. Everyone, please leave the train. All right, Ryan. So we are here in the last stop. The uh, best segment, the people's segment. The people's, uh, the people's segment, my favorite segment, your favorite segment. Um, we've got, uh, uh, it, it's the last segment of the show where you and I each describe one thing that we've encountered that week. Something we ate, smelled, cooked, saw, read, uh, and it, it's something that fed the spirit of wonderlust that made us, uh, you know, seek to travel that, that gave us that spirit of travel, even during the workday week. So Ryan, what's your last stop this week? Have you ever left something at airport security? Yes. I once left, uh, my full book bag. Actually it went wow. through, it went through and you know, it was one of these things where I was rushing to a flight. I mean, I only got, you know, maybe few hundred feet away and then you get that like uh that phantom limb where you go oh my god why isn't there right. something that weighs 50 pounds on my back <laughs> right and so i did run back i immediately found it but that that's the most i've ever left behind i mean do you think you've ever left any change when you put you pull the change out of your pocket I, i'm sure you're, you're a guy who carries you know a lot of change uh, <laughs> uh you, do you think you've ever left any any change but you know yeah uh, i'm sure i mean yeah, you, yeah. you know i'm very meticulous about my money right. so uh in a, in a very scrooge like way i do try to mark every penny that i right. put down but you might have even lost a penny or two you don't you don't know it's yeah, possible it it's certainly possible yes because the bins you know they 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 you know things can things can kind of get lost there well you would not be alone if you've left uh, a few nickels and dimes because last year... Oh, I would never leave a dime. I mean, well, yeah. it, you know, when well, it's at that level of value, I'm not just trusting it to anybody. No, fair. And I probably wouldn't leave a dime either. Um, no, but, I, I, I ask if they'll allow me to carry that on my body as I go through the metal <laughs> scanner. You're like, I can't part with I can't this possibly. This is, do you know what this is worth? Yeah. Well, other people are not as, as on point as you. Um, <laughs> because last year in the United States alone at TSA screening checkpoints... More than nine hundred and sixty thousand dollars in coins. Were oh left. my God, that's a lot of money. And what are they applying that money to? Well, believe it or not, the money is deposited into a TSA account, and it's used by the TSA in their operating budget. That's fantastic. That's exactly what I would <laughs> want it to be doing. So, Ryan, you're saying that uh, when you see those uh, TSA dogs patrolling, 
that that could be money that came from out of your pocket to pay for those beautiful animals to sniff out drugs. It is, it is quite possible, yeah. Uh, the, the money that is left, and it has gone up every year uh, for the last several years, uh, and it's basically it's gone up $100,000 uh, since 2016, so close to a million dollars now. Now, that's, um, that's really surprising to me because I would have thought as uh, mobile people banking— carry, People carry less change, Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe people are just like, the economy is doing well. They don't care about that quarter, you know? I don't need that quarter. I, you know, this this could be a future last stop. We need a piece of gear, a, a travel change purse. Yeah, well, I don't carry I don't carry change, uh, so I don't know that I've ever left any change. I've definitely like once I've I I left my wallet, the, my whole wallet, and uh, luckily they they had it for me when I ran back. I'm like, oh my god, I can't fly across the world without my wallet. Um, that would be a problem. Uh, you know, so uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's it's pretty interesting though and they do give you some of the things that they've actually spent the money on um and one of those is the translation of checkpoint signage into foreign languages so you know you're making america more welcoming when you leave a few of those coins in the old bin um guess what the number one airport was for change loss yeah i couldn't say jfk really yeah number I, it, one. Feel, it feels like more of a newark thing oh newark is number five all right what's number two Number uh, it's uh, JFK, L.A., Miami, O'Hare, Newark. That's the top five. Um, you know, JFK almost seventy five thousand dollars in change. Uh, left wow, by you those think busy could, New Yorkers? They could use that for uh, improvements to JFK. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine how bad JFK would be without that seventy five grand? <laughs> <laughs> so, in other words, folks, if you're going through JFK, JFK, leave some change in those bins. God Almighty. Yeah, please do. Please do. We we need them. Uh, we need that here in New York, and I, I, you know, O'Hare definitely needs it. So Actually, you, maybe we should start sprinkling some change in the New York City subway, <laughs> too. Just throw down some coins. They'll start improving. Yeah, something tells me that no matter how much money you throw in the New York City subway, that's not getting any better. But Do, we doomed shall to see. fail. Yeah. <laughs> what, is, uh, what is your last stop uh, this week, Kieran? Well, Ryan, um, we did an episode all about uh, passports long ago, uh, Passports 101. We followed it up recently with Passports 102. So the first time we talked about sort of the security that's built into your passport the, the, the second time we talked about why your passport is a historical document as much as it is a travel document. And uh, we had a listener send in to me uh, a wonderful website that I was unaware of called passportindex.org. And passportindex.org uh, collects and studies passports from every country around the world. And so you can look at high quality scans, not of the interior, unfortunately, of each of the passports, but you can see the front cover, the variety of insignia and colors uh, and language on uh, passports from all around the world. And you can also uh, see how they compare to one another. So they actually rank what are the most useful passports to have, what are the least useful, and uh, it helps you gauge uh, how you rank in the passport you hold. And uh, I guess I, it actually surprises me, and I, I don't know why I'm surprised by this, but the UAE has the strongest passport in the whole world. That's exactly right. You have uh, the number one passport power rank, uh, which is built by Passport Index, is the, uh, the United Arab Emirates. The way that they uh, do the ranking is um, they judge uh, first on how many uh, other countries you can get into visa-free. Then how many you can get visa on arrival? So you don't have to apply before you go. You just show up, you apply for the visa. Usually a pretty my fast favorite, process. My favorite kind, yeah. I, li I like visa free. I, I would imagine that's your favorite kind. Sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, but, but at least when you get to the airport, having the ability to bribe someone and get a visa seems like w something worth having. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And uh, finally, uh, a visa required. Uh, and this would be uh, you know, something that you've got to apply for beforehand. And so the UAE has 116 visa free countries. Uh, visa on arrival, 57, and visa required, 25. Just to give you some context of where that fits, you have a lot of the European Union sitting in the top two or three rankings. And that's because uh, some of the individual countries, Luxembourg, Finland, Spain, they actually have more visa on arrivals than some of their, their EU partners. And uh, the United States is actually at passport power rank four, right there with uh, Japan, Malta, uh, Singapore, and uh, we have uh, 116 visa-free, uh, 50 visa on arrival, and 32 visa required.
And this uh, this website, Passport Index, has a handy feature where you can select different passports and then compare. And I just looked up the UAE and the United States, and I scrolled down to Brazil. And sure enough, visa-free travel, Brazil, UAE. Uh, you know, had I be a UAE resident, my life would be different in a lot of ways. But I would not have been turned uh, turned away from Brazil without a passport. Yep, you would have uh, without, without a. You would have you would have actually seen Brazil instead of just <laughs> the interior of its airport. Yeah, the, the 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 section of the airport before you get out of security. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh. So. Uh. Right. I. I. Lo- I really. I, I could spend hours browsing on this website, passportindex.org. Uh. And again, I. I. We are so interested in knowing what foreign passports look like on the inside. Surprisingly hard. One of the few things that hasn't made it on the internet. But uh, this website was a great way to start out looking out at the iconography on the exterior. So check it out. And uh, please send us what your passport looks like. Give us your analysis of, of the artistry and the design at outofofficepod at gmail.com. And what are we talking about next week, Kiernan? Ryan, next week, ah, this is, this is going to be so much fun. We are doing uh, another uh, destination-specific episode. Ooh. We are going to talk about national parks of the Pacific Northwest. And the reason we're doing that is because I am just about to go there. I, I'm doing a two-week trip. We're hitting Mount Rainier. We're hitting Crater Lake. We're hitting Olympic National Park and all the places in between. So it's going to be an exciting episode, National Parks of the Pacific Northwest. Well, I cannot wait for that, Karen. The, the, you, you speak with more passion about national parks than, than Smokey the Bear. I am uh, super, I mean, it, it's, he, he must love parks. Uh, so I'm super excited to, to hear about your trip, and uh, hopefully you'll have some good pictures to share on the old Instagram. Absolutely. And uh, what's the Instagram uh, handle again? O O O podcast. Absolutely. And that's because I, it, that's one O for each of the national parks that I'll be visiting. O O O podcast. Uh, so, Ryan, until then, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. The seat taken. You think you're going to see bears when you go? Um... I, I hope to see Smokey the Bear. Often yeah. you'll get a uh, Smokey the Bear sign as you enter into a park I, and it I shows so. what the fire level is. I take right. a nice picture with that. And well, uh, I, I hope, I hope these, these days anyway. the fire level can be very high in, in Pacific Northwest. So I hope that it's low. Uh, I don't know. I, you know, I understand there's a lot of moths. So I'm really looking forward to the moths. Oh, uh, moths are great. Not moths. Oh, moths. moss. Oh, yeah, yeah. Moss. moss is also great. <laughs> All great.